All right, welcome to the Legal Academy episode one. Uh, my name is Oren Kerr. I'm a law professor at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, and this is a new show uh, about law professors, about who we are, uh, what we think, how we're doing, uh, and what being a law professor is all about. Um, the idea is to have a weekly show. Uh, often it'll be talking about scholarship. Uh, sometimes we'll be talking about the hiring market, sometimes about teaching, about the role of clinics, about <clears throat> international perspectives. We're going to cover all of these uh, issues. Uh, and our very first guest uh, is Akhil Amar from Yale Law School. Uh, very excited to have Akhil here, the Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science. Uh, Akhil has been a professor at Yale Law School since 1985, so for 35 years. Uh, and uh, uh, just from the very beginning of his career has been just at the very top of the law professor game with so many great books and articles, uh, really moving conversations in a way very few law professors do. So, so I'm very excited to have the very first uh, episode be Akhil, and I'm basically just going to we're going to talk about law professors and what law professors do and and scholarship and 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 uh, mistakes people may make or ways to think about uh, what we do. Uh, so, Akhil, thank you very much for for joining me for, for episode one. Uh, and I wanted to start with the question of uh, scholarship and in particular, when you're writing, what are your goals when you're writing and if those goals have changed over time? Sort of, who do you think of as your audience? What are you trying to achieve? And is that different today than it was when you started as a law professor? Thanks so much for having me. Um, it's an honor to be uh, here. <clears throat> so uh, uh, I think um, over time, I've begun to figure out what I'm doing. Um, a Kierkegaard, I think, said that um, uh, we live life in prospect, kind of going forward, but it only makes sense in retrospect as we sort of look back. Um, and uh, um, as um, I've gotten older, I think I probably think more about the past um, and reflect on it. Oh, that's what I was up to. That's what I was doing. <clears throat> and at the time, I didn't quite know necessarily what I was doing. Uh, I've always tried uh, to write things that, that I'm interested in them. Um, I've tried to pick topics where I would learn something in the course of, 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 of researching an issue and try to share with others what I think I've learned. Um, uh, I've come to understand much better um, my field, my position in my field, um, and the implications and entailments of that position um, as I've begun to develop a, a bigger position. I, I started out writing small things, smaller things. As time went on, I'd write on this topic and that topic and, the, and another topic. And then I began to look back and said, oh, these things connect up a little bit. There's, there's an iceberg underneath the, 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 the tip. I, I actually have certain um, uh, patterns and themes and, and interests. What are those? certain commitments. I, I begin to have a, a vision of the field um, that I didn't have at the very beginning. How would you when you're just starting out? You're, you're just like trying to get tenure or, or trying to just make it through the, the, the year, trying not to be an embarrassment to your school or um, uh, your alma mater. In my case, those those the same thing. Um, so um, for me, um, it turns out, oh, and how does all this connect to your teaching? Uh, I used to think at the beginning that I taught law. Um, I still think I teach law, but I now would say, actually, I teach students. Um, and a lot of my growth has been in conversation with my students. I write something, I share it with them, they push back in various ways, and then I write something else, and they push back in other interesting ways, and then things build. Um, not everyone, truthfully, who's watching may have the same experience, because I'm in an unusual place, because my students are superstars, you know, um, and that that depending on where you are in, in the pecking order, you may have fewer superstar students than I've been fortunate enough to have. 
from day one who have, who have helped me develop my themes. I've come to think that I, um, in terms of my field, um, I teach constitutional law um, and across the board. I, I started out actually writing more in fed courts, a subset of constitutional law. And the, um, uh, but as time uh, went on, I, just, I began to develop this uh, um, uh, idea that, oh, I'm interested in all of constitutional law because um, I'm interested in this topic and that topic and another topic and, and what do they have in common? Actually, they're just all con law. And then I began to um, uh, become, I think, increasingly interested in uh, the text history and structure of the Constitution um, above and beyond what the cases say. Um, I developed more of a commitment to a certain kind of originalism um, and uh, a certain kind of vision of democratic constitutionalism. So why would originalism make sense? Because Canada doesn't do it that way and a lot of countries don't. And that's because Canada didn't actually begin with the bang the way the American constitution did by, with people putting the thing to a vote up and down the continent. That's a, that was a big thing in the world. Um, and, and so, and, it, just so I understand, when you're writing now, do you think of your audience as interested, you know, it could be your students in part, because as you say, they're pushing you in, 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 in certain ways. Um, it could be just general legal audiences or people who might buy your books or academics, or it could be courts. And so one interesting question, especially for those of us writing in public law, is to what extent are you thinking of, you know, here's an idea, but the justices will never buy this, or here's an idea, wait a minute, this might get some play. Should, should you be influenced when you're writing in an area of public law by what is possible at the Supreme Court? So my own view is that what has worked for me may or may not work for other folks. So I, you know, I'm going to be as utterly honest as I can be about my life, but I'm not sure it's totally replicable. Um, um, we'll talk later about how you get a job. I didn't do a fellowship. I don't have an advanced degree. Um, uh, wow, that puts me in a very, um, um, uh, a very small subset of people who get jobs um, uh, today. I, I started teaching at age 26. Um, wow, that, that's just, so, so what has worked for me may not work for other people. Here's what's, uh, what I am saying is, I've tried to figure out what my ideas are, what their implications and entailments are, and I begin teaching, yes, I begin writing for my students. Most of all, Owen Fiss, who was one of my mentors, told me, um, he says, Akil, I, I write for my students because they'll read my work more carefully than anyone else. And I, so I think there's some deep truth to that. So I started with my students, but my students are really different than almost everyone else's. They're, you know, they're the tippy top. A lot of them go on to, to clerk, a third of them clerk. Um, you know, my best students go on to clerk at the Supreme Court, and that can lead to Supreme Court justices paying attention maybe to what I've written because their law clerks are telling them that. And that might not be true for everyone who's watching this podcast. So, you know, something that was a sensible strategy for me may or may not be true for everyone else. But if I'm interested in um, the text and structure of the Constitution. If I think it's actually a democratic document, it's short, it's written for ordinary citizens. Oh, well, if that's my view, but it starts with we the people, I have to write stuff for we the people. So that's one audience. Um, I have to eventually write books, which I didn't start out doing. I started writing law review articles, but that's not true to my big idea. If my idea it is to some extent, popular constitutionalism, democratic constitutionalism. If I take that seriously, but I'm telling you, here's the common denominator. I'm telling everyone here, you have to figure out what your idea is. And then you live out that idea. You have to take it very seriously. Given that my idea is constitutionalism and popular constitutionalism, I have to write for ordinary people. Constitutional law is also made by justices. So I actually should be trying to aim for them and I'm trying to aim for lawyers. So I'm very greedy. I'm trying to have it all. I try to reach undergraduates and high school students and a general audience, um, a, a New York Times um, 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 like audience and justices um, and judges and lawyers. And that might not be true for most fields. You, um, tax, for example, is a specialized field. Ordinary people can't be experts in tax law. Um, uh, only, you know, uh, so maybe I should be writing just, if I were a tax person, 
for tax lawyers or antitrust. Constitutional law uniquely is supposed to be actually about the citizenry generally. It lends itself, for example, to teaching an undergraduate course, and I do teach an undergraduate course. I, I didn't start out doing that, but, but um, high school students are interested in constitutional law in a way that they're not necessarily interested in um, antitrust or administrative law or tax law or a gazillion other things. So I have lucked into, um, and again, it may not be replicable, a certain niche where I actually am trying at one and the same time, this is the challenge, to write for um, a really intelligent AP history student in um, uh, uh, junior year who's gonna be applying to top schools next year at one end and Supreme Court justices at another end and um, to um, um, uh, um, lawyers um, who, uh, like you who might wanna um, uh, um, write a brief for the Supreme Court. I actually tend not to write briefs for the Supreme Court or uh, do an oral argument for the Supreme Court. Um, there was a time, and we've lost it, where um, uh, the great constitutional scholars were uh, writing for lawyers and judges and academics. That was the Supreme Court Review Project of the 1960s, Harry Calvin, um, a David Curry, that's what Larry Tribe is trying to do with his treatise. He's trying to be academically ambitious um, uh, and write for judges and have his treatise be in every law firm's library in the country. These three different um, uh, sociological worlds, the academy, the bar, the bench, have actually pulled away from each other. It's do, harder do to, that, to straddle. So do you see that as a good thing? an inevitable thing a bad do you have a take on that because that i mean it does seem like a significant trend over the last few decades of just the the split of these three yes, different worlds it, and it is my own personal view is that although we're academics and we're part of the university we actually i start again i used to think i taught long i think i teach students most of my students even at yale law school actually want to be lawyers Believe it or not, you know, <laughs> um, even at Yale, and that's uh, true so much more at UC Berkeley or at uh, University of Illinois, where my brother is dean. Now, if they want to be lawyers, they're paying my salary deep down, and, and I have to respect that. And so I want to give them value. I want to actually give them stuff that's going to be helpful for them to do what they want to do most of whom they don't want to be like me. And I'm not teaching in a graduate school of philosophy or political science or history or economics um, or political uh, science. I'm teaching um, people, most of whom want to be lawyers, and I want to give them value by teaching them stuff that will actually help them be good lawyers. And so if I'm only in conversation with a few academical types, you know, in, in, the, in other departments in the university, that might be fun for me, but I don't think it's actually quite fair for my students. Now, again, I'm in a field where I think I can actually give my students value and be in daily conversation in my head, um, even if not literally, with Gordon Wood and Eric Foner, who are the great historians, you know, that I try to think about. Or um, with um, Norm Ornstein, who's the great um, um, political scientist of Congress, or Steve Skronik, who's the great political scientist of the presidency. Um, uh, so constitutional law is taught in a university in history departments, um, in uh, political science departments, and in law schools. And I wanna be in conversation with all three of those academics, um, but that might not be true for someone who doesn't do constitutional law. Now it's a little bit more of a of a tension if um, uh, 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 you're because you want to be taken seriously in the academy you, you're you're in you we're in great universities but we also are training lawyers um, and and I try to finesse that and it's increasingly difficult for many people to do that I get it yeah what one one sense I have also of just thinking of trends in the last twenty I've been teaching now for twenty years and a trend that I've seen and and, and others certainly have. You know, we, we, we've gone from a world, this is, you know, going back to the 60s model of lawyers who happen to be academics to a world of academics who happen to be lawyers or have some legal interest, even if not, not actually being lawyers. Um, 
and and it seems like the modern academic world in a law school is like this cacophony of various voices and you've got the the you know just thinking on a faculty you might have the constitutional law theorists and you might have um uh, law and economics folks and bankruptcy scholars and um uh, uh those with phds in history right. and 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 then a, a workshop at a school might consist of a topic on which of an audience of maybe 25 or 30 people five are sort of subject matter specialists who get it and 25 have some background in it but really coming at it from outsiders i agree how, how, how does a faculty exist what 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 how, how should we go about it if we're in a world in which the scholarly work we spend so much time on is actually a matter of such narrow expertise within a field that our colleagues may not really understand what it is that any one of us are doing. Oren, we're, this is great because we're talking about some of the deep things. I have real concerns about, I tend to be more of an internalist, want to focus more on law and partly because I'm not sure that a law school works so well if we try to simply become a little university within a university replicating um, the entire range of university studies um, partly because um, there's a Tower of Babel problem. We actually lose an ability to actually um, uh, be able to talk to each other with a lingua franca, which used to be law. We also are at risk of having actually second best economists, second best philosophers, second best political scientists, folks who actually aren't necessarily good enough to, to get um, uh, jobs in, 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 in th that discipline who are also second rate lawyers. So I actually, I'm a very old fashioned and fuddy daddy. I want everyone on my faculty to, or at least if not everyone, a real critical mass to be able to understand law from an internal point of view, by which I mean law as it's practiced by those who do it. Um, you, know, what, what, you know, the question is, what is law? Well, that's a deep jurisprudential question. I approach it kind of sociologically and, and, and pragmatically. Law is what lawyers do. And that's what, I, so I have to think about what my students are going to be doing and I want to try to figure out ways of, of helping them be very thoughtful for their lives about what it is that they're doing. And if half of my colleagues or two thirds of my colleagues have no clue what lawyers do, um, many of them didn't even, if not, many of them didn't even go to law schools. So they don't even have that common socializing experience. They've never clerked. They've never worked actually as a lawyer in government. Um, they've never had a law job. I, I actually um, worry uh, um, about whether that's a sort of sustainable model. And, and my school began the problem. Um, you know, um, no, because legal realism and interdisciplinarity, and it used to be law, a law school, then it became law and, you know, then it became and law, you know, and now it's just and. Um, and that's um, a, a real, it's a genuine concern, Oren. Um, you so, so, actually so, so, so know a lot behind. of you, you know a lot of tech stuff, but you also, you're a real law person. You write about legal problems at about the level of generality that they arise in litigation, um, in transactional work, um, in court. Um, and and you, you, you and I have similarities. We're kind of hammers looking for nails. What's the kind of problem that we can help judges and lawyers think through? And we have more time than they do. And ideally, we're not, you know, just being paid by one side or another. That's the value we can add to the ecosystem. You and I are somewhat similar in that regard. Yeah, I, I think that that rings true. I think there's a, there's, there's a lot to be said for that. But if, what then do you think of, is it inevitable that the forces that are going the opposite direction will prevail it's just because of the incentives of the academy or because of schools wanting to be more academic and less lawyerly i mean is, is it a, is it a trend that is controllable or is it just going to play out so in here's what you and i have to do if we share this view we have to get cited a ton by everyone so people start to say actually Oren did it, it worked for him, Akil did it work for him, we should do more like that. So then we can actually tell our deans and our faculty, no, you don't have to go down this other path. Actually, let's, let's actually have at least enough people on our faculty who are real law people. It's worked well enough for Erwin Chemerinsky, you know, on your faculty, uh, you know, there are people on my faculty, a dwindling number who, who do it this way. You know, if it, if it could work for a Larry Tribe or a David Curry or an Oren Curry or Kilomar, 
we should, not everyone can do this. I, I get that. I, I understand that what's worked for some of us won't actually work for all of us, but I think a law school has to have a critical mass of people who actually understand law from an internal point of view, energized by interdisciplinarity. Um, in my fields, that would be history and political science and maybe um, a political philosophy. Um, in other fields, it would be more economics. And I actually have an undergraduate degree in e economics. I, I, I'm a trained economist. Um, uh, um, and, um, but in, you know, in other fields, it would be sociology or anthropology or economics or something else. But ideally, it should be law and and not just and. So, so let me switch the focus of really the same question, but thinking about it from the standpoint of somebody who's interested in being a law professor. Um, they they're, they don't have a stake in these debates as to what law schools should become, uh, but they're they're just more interested in like what can I do to get a job. Um, so so you mentioned earlier that you're kind of a throwback to an earlier era. No fellowship, no PhD. I also didn't do a fellowship or a PhD. I I think I got in just before that became pretty much required. Um, how how do you advise current law students or recent law school graduates who are interested in being law professors? Should they think that they pretty much have to get a PhD? Should they think they pretty much have to do a fellowship? What what path should they put themselves on to succeed in this field? So I think they should be data driven. Um, if you want to do a share screen, either I can do it or you can do it. I think they should look at Sarah Lasky's data because she's you know she's one of my students and you know I uh, adore. Uh, her, I, again, I'm very proud of my students. She's wonderful. Um, She's great. Former colleague um, of mine at GW. Um, and so if you want to do a share screen or something, we could look at her Venn diagrams. Um, can we do that now? Can I do a share screen? Um, well, I mean, the, the, the numbers are stark enough. We can just say, say, I think I can probably set it for you if you want. Yeah, to. if you just pull it, pull, pull it up. Um, screen here. I think you're now set so you can share your screen if you. Okay, yeah. No, I think I can do it. So let me just. So I'm doing share screen here, share, and we want to um, uh, share. Hmm. Well, maybe. How about if you just pull it up on on yours because it's not quite. Uh, let me try it one more time. No, I'm on a. Comp well, okay. Let, let me just let me just summarize them because uh, yeah. we basically everybody's got a fellowship or a PhD, and like two thirds have or maybe a third have both a PhD and a fellowship and pretty very few people have not at least clerked um, and and I guess I guess so so the the no, advice so I've told students is just yeah you should either think you're gonna get a fellowship or a PhD or else you're right. just and so he, to work and, but, but 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 we need to start frankly even earlier again I'm not making up the rules I you and I are data driven we try to look at the world and see what it is okay and respond to that so the re, the, 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 so this is blunt, um, but um, almost half of the people who got a teaching job this year went to one of three law schools, um, Harvard, um, Yale, and Stanford. If you add NYU, that's more than half. I think 45 of the 84 people got um, went to one of those four schools. And we, and we could add university. We added University of Chicago. And, and, let's not get Brian Leiter too upset, so let's add Chicago too. Uh, um, yes, we, it's <laughs> very important not to get Brian Leiter too upset. Hello. Um, so, so, <laughs> so, 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 but that means that if a kid is graduating from college and she or he is pretty serious about law school, it has implications even for where you should aim. You know, uh, if if you're fortunate enough, um, and that so that's that's the first thing. You uh, you're going to have much greater prospects to get a law job if you go to certain law schools. Point one. Point two. I think it's a world in which um, mentorship counts. And um, so you, you want to, um, I got my job because Guido Calabresi helped me and Bruce Ackerman helped me and Owen Fiss helped me and, and um, uh, Paul Gewurz and, and Peter Sheck and, and Burke Marshall um, all vouched for me. So, um, so and that's like in a, in a graduate school, it's pretty important to have advisors who are gonna, um, a vouch for you. Um, and then um, I do think you should do a clerkship um, um, uh, 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 or if not a clerkship, some uh, intensive apprenticeship in law, 
clerkship is actually um, uh, pretty uh, good because it, it's, it's general and it's a total immersion experience. I would say even two or three years if you're not gonna practice for four or five and really understand what law is from an internal point of view, it's very good to um, see the, the legal world through the lens of, of, a, of a judge. Um, if you're gonna practice for four years, that's fine. Maybe the clerkship is, but if you wanna teach people wanna be lawyers, you should at least have some sense of, of the legal world. There, there, there are different ways of doing it, but a clerkship happens to be one pretty good way of doing that. Um, and if you, um, you're not that, um, that uh, into interdisciplinarity, then do these, this fellowship. Okay, because now you're actually back in the law school. One danger of doing um, the, the PhD route, especially if it's after your law degree, is it's arguably pulling you away from law um, into some other discipline, and you try to, you're thinking about problems that that other discipline thinks are the interesting problems in the way that that other discipline frames the problems, and that may not be actually the problems that lawyers look at and with using the frame that, that, that lawyers would use to, to think about those problems. And although, although to be clear, or when you're giving that, that particular focus of advice, is that what you think the legal academic market wants or is that more just your, from a normative perspective better may, not to it do may be, It may be mine, but I, I think that that's consistent at least with the law ski data. That, that is, I'm giving a pathway that's actually a, a, a wide one. And I am telling you, because the game isn't just getting a job. Okay, I'll be, I'll be really blunt. The game is being Akhil Amar or Orrin Kirk. That's the game. It's not just getting a job. And this actually has really worked well with the people who do the best. We actually know law. Um, and you're going to limit yourself if you move away from law, and yet you want to be a superstar in a law school. Um, it's, it's not that you know difficult a concept that if you want to be a legal superstar, you should know tons of law. Um, and there's an opportunity cost when you're moving away from law. Look, I don't have a PhD, but I promise you, you know, when I talk to Gordon Wood, he doesn't say, "Well, oh, Akili, you don't have a PhD." Or when I talk to um, uh, Eric Foner, and they they, they treat me as because you don't actually. Here's a, like a dirty little secret. You don't need a PhD in history. You need to know how to do history. And David McCullough doesn't have a PhD. And, and Churchill didn't have a PhD. And Thucydides didn't have a PhD. And those are pre three pretty significant historians. Now, other fields, it's not so true. Not so clear that you can just become you know, a really high-tech economist learning stuff on the side. So again, it may be discipline specific, you know, what credentialing and training you need really to be state of the art. But actually, for history, you don't. Um, although, and I actually I would... am an economist, even though I don't have a, a master's in um, economics, but I studied literally with Nobel laureates like Paul Krugman, you know, with, with, um, uh, in, in economics. So, so the creden I'm not saying you don't need to be interdisciplinary. I am saying, well, I don't know about this PhD after law school. It, it may be helpful, may help you get the job, but then 10 years down the line, are you going to be actually at the very tippy top? I don't know. I mean, well, I would say thank you for the flattering idea that you and I would be in the same category. Uh, uh, you are part. ahead of me. Let's, on let's, some, let's, you're, let's, you're younger than I am, and you're ahead of me on some of these high on blind things. Damn you. Remember, remember that part. I think your distinction between getting the job and sort of what happens once you have the job is a really, really important one. And let me, let me just sort of break down thoughts or questions in response to those two different steps. On the, on the getting the job, I mean, you, you'd mentioned that um, you – Typically, the hires are from a very small number of law schools and have a certain set of credentials. There, there does seem to be this very intense credential focus. Um, and so my first question is just on the hiring process. Why do you think that is? Why should it be that so often people that are becoming law professors are at Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Chicago, and you know maybe one other school, um, instead of a wider range? It, it, is, are those schools getting the people that are the most academically interested? Is it um, that pe schools are just so focused on the credential that they just look at the resume and they say, okay, this person went to Yale, must be a good law professor. Well, like, what? well there's a lot of path dependence, but people who want to do this, you know, uh, uh, now there, there, there can be mistakes because not everyone's an early bloomer, uh, for example. Um, but 
the people who want to be law professors tend to go to those schools because they look at the data um, and, and, and see the track record. And, and, and the world changes, but it changes um, uh, sometimes slowly, glacially. Look, Oren, um, you, uh, 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 if you take, so uh, I'm gonna uh, play, uh, just be a lawyer economist. You look at the economy and the top 100 firms today bear no relationship to the top 100 firms in America in 1920. It's Schumpeter Creative Destruction. The biggest firms in America today didn't even exist 30 years ago. Apple, um, Google, um, Microsoft, um, um, Facebook, um, and Amazon. Okay, I'm not sure any of those even existed 40 years ago, and those are the big five today. And Consolidated Tin, American Can, they don't exist. Total churn huge dynamism. The only, the only 10 of the top 100, 100 years ago that survived today, Standard Oil of New Jersey and California become ExxonMobil. Okay, now you look at American higher education. You take by reputation the top 100 universities in 1920, and you compare them to the top 100 universities today, there's no change. There's only 10 that have made a significant move one way or another. In When the constitution is adopted, there are nine schools in America, the seven oldest Ivies um, and uh, William and & Mary and, and Rutgers, then called Queens, now it's called Rutgers. Um, um, and, and the seven Ivies are private, the other two, William & Mary, Rutgers, became public. You take those seven, seven, the seven oldest schools that have always been private, U.S. News Today ranks those seven as among the top 14 today, 200, you know, two, more than 200 years later. Um, American education is very high bound in all sorts of ways and law is extremely high bound and credential conscious um, and um, so and I didn't make these rules up I'm not advocating them I'm just trying to look at the world and seeing what the patterns are um, okay. so I would say that both of the things you said are true um, people who want to do this try to get into those these schools and these schools aren't so easy to get into. And then when you do pretty well at these schools, um, um, you get hired by graduates of these schools who are the ones who are increasingly dominating um, the, the hiring. Um, uh, um, uh, um, 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 the faculties at most universities are very similar. Um, the student bodies have more variation, right. but the, the faculties tend to have gone to these schools. And, and so let me, let me take, part two of this, the once people are at a school and then they've, you know, the tenure rates in law schools are very high traditionally. Uh, and so let's assume- There's not enough downward mobility. And if there were more downward mobility, there would be more upward mobility. There'd be more churn. And I'm actually in favor of that, but that's not where we are. Right, right. So let's assume the world we're in where people have started at a school, very high chances they're gonna get tenure. And then they gotta sort of figure out what to, to make of their career. And, and um, do you have a sense, I mean, do we know yet as to whether the credentials that serve as these proxies uh, at the entry level so often are still decent proxies sort of career wise? And, and, and a, a way this often comes out, I've been in appointments committee meetings and faculty committee meetings where someone will say, oh, this person's got a PhD in economics, they'll be doing very sophisticated work or this person doesn't have this background. And making a credential argument usually about PhDs, not about, you know, they wouldn't make a point about what school somebody went to, but whether they have a certain credential. And then do, are we at a point yet where we know whether those sorts of credentials actually turn into the goals that lead to the so hiring? The, Is there these a connection would be, there? That's a tenure article right there. Uh, maybe even a, a book project of someone who has serious um, empirical chops. There was a time when I used to be able to do regression stuff, you know, back in, in, in college. Um, um, and one really difficult question is what's actually a genuine metric of success. You're very sweet to say I've succeeded. I like to think that I have, I kind of convinced myself that I have, but, but you know, how would we, how would we know that? How would we measure that? So, so you're going to actually have to have metrics of what actually counts as success. Is it citations? Is it, um, influence, whatever that means. Is it a more subjective thing? You know, do we, should we poll people? But so, you know, if we try to uh, um, look at, and, and we could do it various ways. Um, it could be very, very subjective. Among the people who are at the tippy top, you know, what did they look like 30 years today? What did they look like? 
Um, and, and it might very well be that, that the, um, the pattern for them actually doesn't quite apply all the way up and down the range. Um, and so it might be, oh yeah, the people who are really superstars tend to be superstars from the beginning, um, um, most of them, but not all, but it might also be all these false positives, you know, all these Rhodes Scholar genius types who actually turn out to be complete duds. Um, you know, they say a Rhodes Scholar, the definition of Rhodes Scholar is a, a young person who has a brilliant um, future behind her, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, but um, so um, uh, uh, you and I have been pretty darn productive and truthfully, we don't have to be because there's no downward nobility. They can't fire us, but you and I kind of like what we do when we try to keep doing stuff. Um, I do think that the model that we have has led to a lot of people, I'm not going to name names, um, who, you know, uh, do well in law, go to good law schools, do well in law school, clerk on the Supreme Court. I didn't. Um, clerk on the Supreme Court, um, uh, get great jobs early on, maybe write um, good stuff early on, and then stop. This, this is very sad to me um, uh, because um, uh, someone else, you know, would have maybe been hungrier and kept working for, for longer. Um, but, but it would be a great project to say, who are the folks who have risen the most, who actually have the biggest gap between where they, you know, their, 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 their first position was, um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, George Priest, University of Puget Sound, Jack Balkin, University of Missouri, Kansas City, you know, and, and where they are now, which is at a great law school, something like Jack Balkin, great law school in the top of his, um, you know, field. Yeah, well, um, you mentioned that the question of professors who maybe lose their interest in the scholarly enterprise, and mm -hmm. I'm talking, I've been, I've been teaching for 20 years, and so I've seen the tenure post tenure and then the stage where people maybe think about being like a dean somewhere or associate yeah. dean and sort of think about different paths that, that they may take yes do you, do you have thoughts on how to keep faculties productive throughout their career in a scholarly sense so people can i i i want everyone to really be honest with himself or herself about what their strengths are what their weaknesses are what your comparative advantage is and you learn that about yourself as time goes on. And so if you can't contribute in one way, try to figure out something else. Try to figure out what your comparative advantage is. And some people actually, my brother's a dean. He's, and you know him, and he's, he's, he's got a wonderful personality for, for being a dean. I don't necessarily have, have that gift. I have, you know, uh, so I've, I've chosen a, a, um, a, a different path. Um, um, I can tell you over the years, I've moved toward writing books rather than articles. I, I, I've tried to figure out what my comparative advantage um, is, um, uh, not just what I'm good at, but what I'm good at compared to other people. Michael Jordan, you know, we're hearing a lot about him today, you know, and how he compares to LeBron and all the rest. He actually really loved baseball. He, maybe he loved baseball more than basketball, but he couldn't hit a major league curve. So that wasn't his comparative advantage. Um, um, and so um, I, I, you know, I'm just, I'm very kind of um, uh, unimaginative this way. I think like each of us should try to figure out, you know, what our highest and best use in life is, you know, where, where we can be, you know, we fit into the ecosystem in a way that actually adds value to others. Um, and, and as your life unfolds, you're going to learn more about what you're good at and not and what you like and, and, and don't and things will happen to you in life. And, and it's not always then, I think, a bad thing that you move off of a certain track and into a different track. You know, that, 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 that's a natural life cycle. Although it seems like the standard tenure track law professor model doesn't have too many other paths, right? For, well, you for, mentioned one, administration. You be a dean, you can do administrative work, you could be on committees. There aren't, you know, it, it seems like that there's a f relatively fixed, you know, everybody has the same teaching load typically. Well, and... no, they don't. Okay, so I'll be straight. I teach, you don't know this about me, I teach about three times as much as anyone else on my faculty. Okay, I actually do. I'm, and I'm ridiculously proud of that. Okay, because I'm actually, I told you, I used to think I teach law, I teach students. My wife all the time used to ask me, why do you teach more than you have to? I said, because they let me. 
for me is actually an advantage because I'm getting my ideas out. The students are pushing back. I teach some of my own stuff. Okay, so so no, you can teach more than you than than you're allotted to, and you should if you're not doing. You know, damn it, I'm actually writing books and doing this. What's your excuse? I think to myself, you know, in my college, because I'm te so. Um, um, here are the people that I actually think about as my, my counterparts. I, I, this is embarrassing, but this is what I actually. So I think, okay, who's the who's the person who's most like me? Well, it would be Billy Joel, you know, or before he died, um, uh, Robin Williams or something. You know, it would be Paul McCartney. I'm a, a Jackson Brown. I'm a singer, songwriter, composer, performer. Okay, I perform my own music. I love doing it. I like actually live audience. I, I pay to do it, you know. Um, um, this is not work for me. This is like what I like doing. And for me, it's really important to actually communicate that to students, in fact. Now, again, I'm in a field, this is not true for everyone else, where when I reach actually a bunch of students, they become law professors and that helps me, you know, um, uh, because I have now acolytes out there. and and I'm teaching undergrads, and this is at Yale College, and these are really interesting people. I have four students who are senators of the United States, you know, um, uh, and not so many people, you know. So, so for me, it's actually not that much of a cost to do that. It's actually net, net, net. But I believe that my story, even though distinctive, isn't unique. So no, if you're not gonna do scholarship, you should do more teaching. You should mentor people. You should be an important force in their lives. I, we just did a, we had commencement today and we couldn't get together in person. So I spent a, an hour Zooming with some people and I like to think I'm actually an important person in their life. Um, so uh, a mutual friend of ours, yours and mine is Neil Katyal. You know, and I think Neil would say, oh, Akil is he's not just my teacher. He's an important person in my life. He's, 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 he's family to me. That's, it's very important for me to, I, I can tell you 15 students who actually, I think, think of me as, as a person in their lives. Um, I, that, that gives me a lot of happiness. It gives me a lot of, so no, actually you can teach more um, and maybe even not more in numbers, but just more in, in, um, in intensity, qualitatively more, giving yourself more to your students, do something. Because boy, we're getting well paid and, and once you got tenure, it's a very cushy gig. So, so uh, this has been a terrific interview. I'm very de I'm delighted that I picked you as my first- uh, I mean, my I'm first candid, right? <laughs> yeah, this is great. Uh, and it, it does a bunch of, comments you've made have been about sort of Yale specifically and how unique Yale is as a law school. Which I, I, I didn't go to Yale. I didn't get into Yale. It's a very good reason I didn't go to Yale. But I think it is a- I, I didn't get into Harvard College, so we're- There you go. It, it, it's a unique, uh, it does seem like a very unique place uh, where a lot of students want to be law professors and, and they can go in sort of knowing that they can always get a job. Uh, but if they want to be a law professor, that's sort of the place to learn how to do it. Um, so that I think raises a question of, is there a unique Yale kind of law professor? Like, is there, is there, is there something about the graduates of Yale that have been in that environment such that they emerge and go on the teaching market several years later with some distinct kind of way of thinking of the world um, or not? And okay, do, do, so here's my view on that, okay. Um, I have two thoughts. So I decided in my, my parents are doctors. I have no one in my family who really was a, a lawyer. So I didn't even know what this was all about, but I was good at school. I was good in elementary school. I was good in intermediate school. I was good in high school. I was good in college. I'm, I'm just like a, a little school person. So I think when I went to law school, I picked Yale and Park because I thought, oh, I might want to be a teacher because that's very safe. I I'm good at that. That's like my little niche. I can, I can just stay here and be in school forever, you know, and, 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 and be um, uh, uh, like, oh, oh, when Harry Pot Potter, who's his friend who becomes um, professor of herbology, um, uh, Longbottom, Neville, okay? Neville ends up, you know, back at Hogwarts or something, okay? So my third year, of, you know, because it's where he went to school and he's just very sick. My third year of law school, I decide, oh, I really do want to be a law professor. So I sit in for a second time on my favorite 
um, teachers and sort of reflect on what do they have in common, you know, in their teaching stuff. The answer was almost nothing. Guido Calabresi does things very differently than Owen Fiss does things very differently from Bruce Ackerman. So they had almost nothing in common in their style and their themes. And Here's the only thing they had in common. Each was authentic. Each was true to himself. Each act, no, none of them hid. Each one kind of understood who he was, what his ideas were, and was pretty honest about that and let it all hang out. And you ask what a professor is, you say, well, professor, a professor is someone who professes the truth as it's given unto him or her. And, and I'll tell you what I really think. You don't ever have to agree. I don't agree with my professors. Why should you have to agree with me? I want you to know what I think, just like I know what Owen Fist thinks. I know what Bruce Ackerman thinks. I know what Guido Calabresi thinks. I disagree with each of them on, on something, but they're in my head. And I want to be in your head. And you don't have to agree with me, but we are, um, they were all honest. They professed, okay? So that's the Yale key. We're, we, we, now, the, the difference... I, when I do admission stuff and when people get into more than one place, I do not tell them that Yale is the best school. I do not believe that Yale is the best school. I say in certain regards, not for everything, you know, like not if you want to do tech, for example, I think we're the best small school. I actually think that Harvard's the best big school. Um, and there's a difference between a big school and a small school. And each has some advantages and disadvantages. We have an intimacy. Um, so scholarship at Harvard has characteristically been more focused, for example, on case books and treatises because the ratio of professors to students is different. So, so great scholarship is teaching material at Harvard. Um, Hart and Sachs, Hart and, 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 and Wexler, legal, legal process. So, so um, Yale has tended to produce articles and books. Um, Harvard has tended to produce case books and treatises actually. And I believe this is in part um, because of the difference in the scale of, because um, Yale has twice as many faculty per student as, as Harvard does. Um, and those are sort of two somewhat different models. Harvard can have more professors, can cover more topics, and um, it's part of a, a bigger university with a stronger uh, b business school and the stronger, um, we could go in, I, I'm gonna get in trouble if I'd say all the departments where Harvard is stronger than Yale, but the answer is actually, you know, so don't get me in trouble, you know, tr many. Many. So, so, um, so I, I've, said, I've said that's now two things. I've said um, the, um, three things. Most professors, the good ones, in my view, are very different from each other. The only thing they have in common is a certain honesty and integrity. They're, they're kind of, they are, try to be aware, self aware, and they're open with students about all of that. Um, um, and there is a difference between. Uh, a Yale model, which is very small and intimate, um, where um, I get to kind of into the lives of my students maybe a little bit more, and a Harvard model um, where the ratios are just a little different, but it has many offsetting advantages because um, of its great size. Great. Akhil, thank you so much for, uh, for joining me uh, here. I know this is going to be um, uh, this was a great interview, and I know a lot of people are going to enjoy it and learn from it. So thank you. I don't want to put you on the spot, but have you figured out some of the others that um, who are going to be on the list? You want, you uh, want to give um, us a sneak preview? Uh, you know, I, I don't have enough uh, acceptances yet to uh, <laughs> to do that. Although armed with Akil Amar, I mean, I feel I can go forth and say, you know, Akil did it. You got to do it too. So so hopefully it should be a good group. But the idea is to really um, get a range of different views, uh, different schools, different topics. Um, clinicians, um, uh, 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 people from around the world, uh, teachers. I want to do a, a, a some on teaching on Zoom, which may be something we're kind of stuck with. Sort of the idea is to replicate the conversations that you would want to have in a faculty lounge if you walked into the faculty yeah. lounge and you saw, oh, those are the best people to have this conversation with and to try to try to bring those conversations. Let, me, let me say one other thing that I should have said a long time ago. Here's what's actually helped me a lot. Um, I have role models. I really think about who some of my favorite um, teachers and scholars were of an earlier generation, what I really admired about um, their work. I actually tr sometimes try to study um, the, the arc of their careers in, in certain ways. Um, and um, for me, at least, it's been very helpful to think about um, and not all of them are in law. I mentioned Gordon Wood or something in, in um, or Eric Foner, um, but, um, but
but I actually think it's, it's, it's helpful to, and, and some of these people, you know, they died before I even came along. Um, some of them, I never got a chance to tell them that they were my role models. I should have and, and didn't while they were around. But I actually think it's genuinely helpful to try to think um, very concretely about folks who have done it before. And what kind of scholar do you want to be like? Yeah, agreed. All right, great. Thanks so much. Okay, bye now.